Hello everyone, we're the UMA Project. My name is Michael Honick. I was one of the co-producers on the project, um, and, and my background is actually in accounting and television production. And my name is Tim Lee. My background is film and sound design. Hello, my name is David Tiot. I am also a film and sound design background. I'm Christine Barnes. I was the other co-producer and the fine artist on the project. My background is in theater and technical theater, mainly film history. So real quickly, uh, just, just for those of you that don't know, an ETC semester project is, first of all, a semester long. And what you're seeing here is, is the result of a, a team not self-assembled, but put together by the faculty to try to accomplish a goal in a very short amount of time. And this is going to be a little bit different than the other presentations, because this is the final presentation we gave at the end of the semester as kind of a results sort of a thing. So. Thank you, ma'am. Kokoro Robotics was our client this semester. They are, they are actually here today. Kokoro is a company, they are, they are owned by the same Rio group, the same group that makes Hello Kitty. But Kokoro themselves actually make animatronic dinosaurs, giant insects, uh, the dream goat that you see there, and, and other animatronic characters for amusement parks, theme parks, museums, things like that. They're, what they brought us was, was a very special challenge. It was the Actroid. The Actroid is a humanoid robot designed to simulate a, a human performer and interactive human experience. So, our challenge was to figure out, you know, this is where the technology is, where can we take it? We looked at the existing research that's been done in humanoid robotics, we're actually building very much on, on Merrick's work and on Quasi's work especially, we came up with the idea that our goal would be to shift the focus of humanoid robotics from realism to believability. What, what that essentially means is what we found is, is that unlike projects like Quasi, where, where we're focusing on this awesome character-based, believable, it's like a cartoon, we have this problem where you're trying to simulate a human form and, and it's, it's not as successful. And we were trying to figure out why and, and how could we change those outcomes. So what we did is we divided our goal into three specific areas. We looked at practic our practical goals. What could we do to improve the Actroid's technology, basically make using her a better experience from a software side? We looked at the psycho psychological. How could we help audiences better res respond more like they do to Quasi, uh, to the Actroid? And finally, philosophical. What, what we have here that's, that's special about humanoid robots is it's, it's almost, it's, it's an attempt to simulate human life, human emotion, things like that. What kind, of, what kind of deep questions are you asking when you're doing things like that? So, one of the first things we had to do was look at our limitations. Like I said, we only had a semester, we had to move quickly. We have uh, an interesting balance here. Uh, working on a robot has, has the potential to be hugely technical challenge, but we only had one programmer, Yan Lin, who's not with us here today. I think she's watching. Hello, Yan. She's in, she's in the Chicago area right now. Uh, we also, unlike some of the other, other robotics projects you heard today, we, came, we had a robot already built, and we were not able to, we didn't have the skills or the time to add functionality to her. And finally, you know, we were working with, like you said, I said, an already built system that was built by people from Japan, and we don't speak Japanese, and that communication and reading documentation and understanding software was very difficult. So on the practical side, what did we do? We made a Maya animation tool and that was very much, our research was built on the research that, of Quasi. We built an exporter that allowed us to take our technology that we developed and have it speak to the technology that Cobra Robotics developed. And we also looked at face detection, which, which as you know, a camera senses a face and an image, and then we had the robot actually look at that face, pick out that position in space. So here's our original interface to animate. You can see it's rather confusing. I don't know what that kind of animation would look like on a person. So that, that was the problem. So, so we moved to a system that looks more like this. Now you have a system, what you see, the blue balls and triangles represent the, the, the physical joints that are built into the robot. And we have facial controls, things like that. Here you can see the whole system put together. It's very intuitive. Now instead of an engineer or the four guys that built the software animating the robot, you can have people who are specialists in, in making believable motion, creating believable action, come in and work on your system. 
And, and, and like I said, we, we built a tool that allowed you to press one button, take all that data, turn it into a form the robot could read, and send it on its way to be played back on the robot. So we brought in, we are not animators, we brought in some animators to use our tool. These are some of the things they said uh, among you know, critical feedback that we would then take, tweak the rig, go back and improve it. And the, the biggest thing, and I, I think is very interesting, is that it's, 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 very, it's very hard to take a perfect digital environment and, and bring it into reality. That's, that's uh, the, the real world, real physics, cloth, things like that are very complex and, and tough to animate around. So then face detection. Now we have face detection on our robot. It's a webcam above her head. She will pick out her face like you said, I said. And it works just, just fine. It's perfectly technically sound. The problem is that it's not believable. So because of that, we've decided it wouldn't be one of our final finished, we were going to call it done. Because if it's not believable, it breaks, the, it breaks the illusion, it breaks the character, and it goes from being fun to creepy, which when something looks like a human, you, you know, that's a, that's a big problem and something that happens quite easily. So here's a video of our face detection system in action. You can see she, she really like. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, it's, if, if you know, she's looking at Yan and you're me, it's a very striking effect, but if you're the person being looked at, it's like, when do the lasers start? It's a little, it's a little scary. <laughs> So we also had to look at the psychological aspect of the project. Um, when we introduced her to audiences, they noticed her limitations immediately. Her hands are a little strange looking. She's very robotic when she moves. She kind of moves like this. There's, it's, it's really, there's an element there that disconnects the audience. So what we had to do is extend the suspension of disbelief by using theatrics to enhance her, her good aspects and, and take away her flaws, or hide them at least. So we did this by creating a character. So when she came to us, she was an actroid. We named her Yume. That was the first step in giving her her character. Yume stands for Dream in Japanese. She was part of the Dream series, so it all worked out for us. We created a character sheet, which you see here, and basically that gives a full history about traits and background information. Um, anything you want to know about Yume, it's in there. She'll even tell you what her favorite food is. We also sat and looked at different costumes. We tried different clothes on her, we tried dresses, we tried pants, we tried v-necks, we tried anything we could humanly think of to see what would work best on her. We also looked at what we really needed. What we needed was attention. So we developed this kind of goth-looking character. We put it all together. I built a, a costume here for her based on what we decided. And we chose this, she's kind of goth with a twist. She's more bright, she's in, inviting, she's got lots of color to her. We did this for a few reasons. One, we wanted her to be seen from the back of the room. The minute you walked into the room, you saw her and went, oh, what is that? The next thing was children. When we first had her, children didn't want to go anywhere near her. They just looked at her like, that's too strange. No, thank you. But once we put her into bright colors and we made her more friendly in that, in that inviting aspect of her with the shiny clothes, they really wanted to be a part of her. So we also created some stories. We used the Rogerian therapy technique to kind of trick the audience into thinking they're having interaction with her. So the first story is a trinket story in which they go and do a scavenger hunt. She asks them to go and find her trinkets, and if they find them, they get to keep them. The next is a dream journal book, which she tells them that she doesn't get to dream, so she'd like them to write in her book so she can read them later. The last aspect was a voice. We needed a voice for Yume. We hired an actor to come on in and give it a shot, and she did beautifully. But when we got to our soft opening, they said, you need a Japanese accent. So we asked a student from the university to, in fact, our own department, Kano Taki, to come in and do a test for us. She is Japanese. She did a wonderful, wonderful test for us. She's not an actress. And so between the two, what we learned was we really needed a Japanese actress to do her voice. <laughs> this is where we were before and where we are now. Are you surprised that I'm a robot? Take a look at me. I look just like a student, don't I? Well, I'll never be a student. 
be exactly like you. That isn't so bad. Actually, I like being an Andrew. But there's one thing I would change about myself. I have the same dream every night. You also notice in the background, we added black curtains. We also did lighting effects to make it more theatrical. If you notice, it softened her down a lot, made her look a lot more human. This was imperative to our, our decisions in the process. We debuted our own robot at the Carnegie Science Center. Now, the original purpose of the Carnegie Science Center was to demonstrate our final stories and our final animation. However, these were not complete, and we felt that showing an incomplete animation really creeps people out, and so since this was mostly for children, we didn't want to give them nightmares. So we just decided to <laughs> more so our process and how our experiences with the robot are themselves. To demonstrate that process, we put the original animation software next to our uh, Maya rig and our um, animation software to demonstrate how clunky the, the previous animation was to how accessible the new animation is to animators. Um, the, the overall um, acceptance of the robot was extremely positive. The children loved her, and um, here are a few of our favorite comments made by children around. I was never so interested in robots until I saw her. Julie S. <laughs> now, um, we really wanted to track how costume iteration, how a different costume iteration affects people's opinions about robots, so we developed this survey. Now, in this overly simplified graph we have here, it shows the uh, map, the trend of what our data is showing. In the initial design, the, the one where the uh, orange short sleeves and the uh, British accent, um, you see um, that it's registering as slightly unappealing. However, in the final design, with the colorful and the, the hair and a, a more soothing voice, it's uh, registering as slightly appealing. It's a little fluctuation, but it's still, uh, it's actually, this is an average. So, we had you know, um, really highs and really lows, but overall, we had a slightly appealing uh, uh, approach to the robot. Now, in the middle of the survey, we asked this question. What do you find most engaging about the robot? What do you find most off-putting the robot? Now, this question led to the most dramatic example of what our um, costume iterations are doing for the robot. In every single costume iteration, the hands are commented as the most negative aspect about the robot. However, in our final costume iteration, it's absolutely no one mentioned the hands in, um, as a negative aspect. True, no one labeled them as a positive aspect, but it's still a vast improvement. So after this semester, are we any closer to, uh, to this, this goal? We really feel the answer is yes. We had, uh, like, like David said, our, our audience has responded very positively to our design decisions, and the animator said, yeah, I see the value in this tool, and the client did as well. So we're happy about that. In addition, we had National Geographic come and say, you know, seeing uh, artists work with robots is something new, something interesting, and we feel their interest suggests that people want this area explored, people are interested in this and want to learn more about it. So we're happy, we're happy about that. We also wrote a research paper that was accepted to the third international conference on human-robot personal relationships. So this is a highly technical conference. So for them to be inviting in a bunch of uh, essentially artists, a, a more art-focused project, we feel is very positive. Their comments on our paper were that, well, we don't think you have the hard data to back up what you're saying, but what you're saying is interesting enough and new enough that we'd like to hear it anyway. So we're excited about that. <laughs> So, so, you know, every, every project like this, you have lessons learned. We learned that uh, it's important to have a balanced team. We really could have used a full-time professional animator. We learned how important it is to communicate well with your client, uh, to have a translator there to translate software and documentation. And we also, we learned that, you know, working in a high-stress environment, we have lots of tours, lots of people coming in all the time, National Geographic, other media. It's, it can be frustrating, but it can also be very energizing, and it can help you, um, just, just stay, stay excited about your project. We also learned limitations are good, even though we said, oh, we wish we had animators. It, this forced us to be more creative, to work, uh, and, and, and to scope our project so that we could show you guys something significant in one semester. So our takeaway is that the, the chance to work on such, such an amazing piece of technology is, is, is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, although you know, clearly it happens more than once in a lifetime for some people. But it, it was really special. It's a great blend of art and technology, and we were, we were thrilled to be a part of it. If we did it again, we'd focus on team balance. We'd work faster. You always want to work, do more with the limited time you have.
So what's the future of Fumi? If Fumi would like to spend a little more time with us, would you like to improve her rig with someone with a really strong Maya rigging background? And we we'll also like to explore Unity purely as an animation platform and build a believable interaction system for Unity. And we also like to give Unity more character and story to explore the future use of actually. Speaking of purpose, uh, we still haven't addressed our philosophical aspect in our project yet. We have this philosophical question in our minds through the whole semester. Like, why overall build humanoid robots like Yumi? Why Yumi is here? What's Yumi's purpose? And what exactly is Yumi? We think about this question really hard, but still cannot find the answer. But after we think again, we feel maybe no answer is the right answer. <laughs> if we look back to human history, it's not the first time we start to do something before we have a practical use in mind. Like astrology. You may say, no, astrology has practical use. It can tell us time and navigation. But why we link them together with lines? And why we name them, give them character, and make story about them? Maybe it's just because we have been staring at them for solemn and solemn nights. The curiosity about the star has become one of our human nature. And such as Yumi, maybe we build a human white robot like Yumi just because the ancient curiosity about ourselves, the most complex and mysterious life form in this universe. So let's ask this question again. What is Yumi? Maybe Yumi is a mirror. A mirror to show us who we are and what makes us human. A mirror to help us answer the ancient question. What is human and why we are here? Thank you.